start, I'd just like to uh, congratulate Gerhardt and, uh, and, the, and the team for putting this, this event on. It's taken a heck of a lot of their energy, but they have enormous passion, and uh, I think it's shown through in this symposium. Okay, before I uh, go and talk about uh, the, the kind of global view and what that, what that means at a New Zealand view, um, I thought I'd just do a wee bit of a recap on yesterday, at least uh, from, from uh, my perspective. Um, yesterday was largely focused on, uh, on problems and mechanisms. Today we're going to be focusing uh, a bit more on solutions and policies. We've got a serious biochemistry lesson yesterday. <laughs> for those of us that, that have been some time out of biochemistry, it was a fantastic refresher. For those of you that haven't touched biochemistry in the past, it was probably like a trip to Mars. But <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it, was, it was an extremely elegant expose of, uh, of uh, the wonderful things in biochemistry. We heard all about genes and fructose metabolism and addiction. We got some empirical evidence. We even heard about trade and, and cancer mechanisms. So we covered quite a lot. Uh, we got a big reminder from uh, Robbie Beaglehole about the importance of oral health. We didn't hear too much on the environment and, and economics and those broader environmental drivers, but I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that anyway. Um, a lot of studies put up, but uh, a bunch of theories and controversies, and it must have been quite interesting for people in the audience who are not used to uh, academic um, conferences or presentations where academics kind of, you get pe people up here and they're singing their song and Sometimes it felt, you know, a little bit evangelical. I mean, I'm the one that gets accused of being the preacher all the time, but I got a few lessons yesterday. But the, um, the controversies uh, are actually a normal part of, uh, of academic debate, and uh, although it must have been a bit interesting for people that hadn't come across that before. But it's interesting that um, I think we end up with most of our debate and discussions around, um, around mechanisms. And um, this, I think this furious debate will always be with us. We're somehow drawn to trying to understand all these, all these mechanisms, and that's quite a bit of what we heard yesterday. Um, I did manage to catch up with, uh, with Robert for a bit, and I wish I had a bit longer time with him, actually, to try and sort out a few of the controversies in a private sort of setting, and that was, that was very fruitful indeed. And um, you'll be pleased to know that the first law of thermodynamics is still intact. Um, <laughs> That a, that a calorie actually is a calorie when it comes to energy balance. Um, so we're pretty agreed on that. We're pretty agreed that, uh, that, that obesity is not a trivial thing, so that's good. Um, but also, a lot of what was being presented yesterday was around kind of mechanisms of the non-caloric effects of nutrients on, on health. And I think that's a kind of a separate deal, and they kind of somehow got confounded a little bit um, yesterday as well. And uh, so that was, um, that was uh, fabulous, and we always enjoy doing that. And actually, it was interesting um, teasing out uh, with, with, with Robert his view and, and, and kind of my view of how we end up in this, in this problem. Um, I think there's, there's, there's universal agreement that this is obesogenic dr environment or this toxic environment, which is kind of driving um, behaviors. Um, my personal view is that it's, that has a direct effect on our behaviours. In other words, humans' behaviours respond directly to the environment. He has more of a view that the, that the environment has an effect on our, on our, on our hormones and our m metabolic systems, and that in turn has an effect on our behaviours, so we're kind of talking the other way around. But anyway, the, the, the dr initial drivers and the end results I don't think are in, in any question, and it's just these mechanisms that we keep debating about. However... Today is on solutions and policies and actions, and I'm sure there's going to be much more commonality in that. Um, I think there is clearly broad consensus on what to do, broad consensus from authoritative organisations such as WHO and WCRF and anybody else that puts out an authoritative document, but there's less uh, evidence or experience on how to do it, and that's been our big problem. And the particular problem I think that we're facing in getting um, action in this space is um, the, the overcoming the powerful industry influence. So I think we're, we're seeking a more constructive um, a, a advocacy agenda today, and we'll be, have a launch um, of the policy brief at the end of the day. Now I'll go through some of the bits that are in that, in that uh, policy brief. 
Um, just before I do, I just, um, did, just did some quick calculations um, based on some of the data that we had from the, from the OPEC study looking at uh, adolescents in New Zealand. And when you look at the relationship between um, obesity, BMI, and the intake of sugar-sweetened beverages, there's actually no relationship. And that's because quite a few people already know that they are overweight and know that they're trying to lose weight and they've cut down on sugary beverages or they're drinking uh, diet beverages. And so you have to pull out the people who are not trying to lose weight or gain weight um, so you can see the relationships. And those that were drinking um, uh, a can, on average a can of sugar sweetened beverages a day were about 3.3 kilograms heavier. And those that are drinking about two, two cans a day were about 5.3 kilograms heavier. And this, this group of people, the proportion of the population that is drinking more than a can or more a day on average is about 40% of our kids. So this is huge. So a, a large hunk, I think, of our obesity can be, uh, can be um, sheeted back to these, to these behaviours. Now, um, uh, um, Kevin Hall recently put out, uh, last year, put out some equations for calculating the, how energy imbalance relates to weight change or differences in weight. And uh, we, we've done one for adults and now we've just done this one for kids, which is slightly more complex because of the growing. But using these equations, um, the estimate is that of, that of the energy within that, in, that sing, in that can of soda, or those two cans of soda, about 50 to 70% of it um, gets, gets that translated into that, into that weight. So um, if that was, and, that, and that's rather concordant, I think, with what we know from other studies around the incomplete compensation for liquid energy. Anyway, that's a little bit of an aside, but just showing you the kind of um, quantitative uh, effects of this. Okay, so this is, this is the launching pad. This is, this is what we have to sheet things home to, is the global action plan uh, for NCDs and non-communicable diseases. This was, um, this was uh, agreed to last year at the World Health Assembly. Most all countries signed up to it, including uh, New Zealand. It is voluntary, but nevertheless, this is the document that we have to refer to. And they've got six areas for action, um, advocacy, uh, leadership, capacity, and so on, reducing risk factors, healthcare systems, research, and uh, monitoring. <coughs> So most of the specific policies are sitting, recommended policies, are sitting there in number three. And within those, I've just gone through them and just pulled out those ones that are relevant to SSBs. These are what WHO is re recommending and they have implications for sugar-sweetened beverages. So first of all, you need a, a, a national policy and action plan on food and nutrition, which we don't have in New Zealand at the moment. Um, you need to restrict marketing and bev uh, marketing of food and beverages to children, and uh, WHO has a whole document on that. There are some p food sector policies and guidelines about reducing sugar content in food, reducing portion size, availability and affordability. Um, quite a bit around public sector healthy food beverage service, and as you know, that's been um, the, that hasn't gone anywhere in New Zealand in the last several years. Uh, health promoting schools and workplaces, taxes and subsidies, social marketing campaigns, nutrition labelling and claims. It's a pretty full spectrum. This is, this is pretty comprehensive. Um, now, when we, so when we then look at which are the ones that are kind of specifically targeting sugar-sweetened beverages or which are more, more generic, um, you know, all, almost all of them are, are, um, are general, so national Policy and action plan, of course, will cover more than sugar-sweetened beverages. But uh, there are some that are specific around sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, reducing sugar content in food and beverages, and that's, that's a role for the food industry um, to play. Uh, reducing portion sizes, as uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, attempted to do in New York, uh, New York City. So there is a role there, availability and affordability, and you saw some of those pictures of corner dairies um, just filled with, uh, with junk food. There's also a specific role around taxes and subsidies for sugar-sweetened beverages and for social marketing campaigns. So as a, as a single entity, I think sugar-sweetened beverages pops up in a number of places. But when we're making our recommendations and policy recommendations, I, have to, we, I think we have to put this in the broad perspective of improving healthy eating, um, healthy uh, foods and beverage, beverages. Um, the, the evidence, you're not going to be able to read this, the evidence is, is quite... Um, 
uh, becoming quite compelling about what is cost effective and not cost effective to do. So these uh, cost effectiveness tables of various interventions ranked by cost effectiveness. Um, the ones in green over here are cost saving. These are cost effective and these ones are not cost effective by current criteria. Um, the ones that always come out on top as the most cost effective are policy ones. Um, food and beverage taxes, reduction of junk food marketing, front of pack labelling and so on. Uh, there are some programs in here that are cost, uh, cost saving or cost effective and there's a bunch down here that are not cost effective. What's in green here are the ones that the governments are refusing to do uh, across the globe and what down here are the ones that the Victorian government and the Australian government were running at the time that we did these analyses. Um, so you can see there's a, there's a mismatch between the evidence on cost effectiveness and what it actually gets picked up in policies and programs. Now I just thought I'd lay out the policy process for you. So we identify the problem, the researchers have a job in creating evidence, policy makers use the evidence to develop policy, policy deciders, that's the politicians, favour the population benefit outcomes and policies are implemented and evaluated. Not. That is not what happens. We might think it is, but that's not what happens. This is what happens. <laughs> we have dozens and dozens of problems over here competing for policy makers and policy deciders. Attention, the researchers are putzing away round, down here, um, writing papers, and occasionally one might get through to policy makers. Um, many cases, the policy deciders, the politicians, make decisions without too much uh, policy backing from the bureaucrats. Um, a lot of the policies are for economic benefit and there's a huge input from vested interests uh, along the way. So this is a messy business. And if we stick with, as researchers, stick with where we traditionally stick, uh, we're not going to have much effect at all. Um, and just to also use, uh, drawing on Gabriel Jenkins' work from, um, from University of Otago, um, which I think has been very insightful, there is a spectrum of world views on the problems and the solutions. And if you look at responses to any task force or inquiry, you'll see public health people saying, on the one hand, this is collective responsibility, policies are priority, need to regulate the industry. On the other hand, the industry is saying individual responsibility, education, self-regulation. So, um, so what happens? And what happened actually with the um, inquiry on obesity and diabetes that happened several years ago? Um, I have to add with a... With a uh, a, a chairperson from the Green Party and at the time of a later Labor government, um, the report from the inquiry landed actually quite close to where the public health uh, recommendations were. Um, then when the government starts describing the problem in its response, it becomes a bit shifted over to the right. And then when they start talking about the preferred solutions, they again get shifted over to the right. And then when you start to measure the eventual action, uh, now, several years later, what's been implemented, um, it's those easy, soft uh, things at that end of the spectrum. So that's the general policy um, process uh, that we're going through, and it actually doesn't end up in implementing the comprehensive approach. Um, just a quick story from, um, from California to, to, to show you the sort of uh, some of the forces against it. There's a couple of uh, counties, uh, towns in, in California, Richmond and, and El Monte, have very high non-white population, poor, one of the highest rates of obesity in California. They had a couple of serious champions as, as uh, mayors and council members who wanted to institute a sugar sweetened beverage tax. Um, and they got, they got uh, assaulted, if you like. They felt assaulted by the American Beverage Association. They felt like it was a game of national whack-a-mole where somebody puts their head up and bang, <laughs> gets knocked down again. Conversation was dominated by the ABA. We are under siege. Um, the, in these two little towns, um, the soda industry spent $3.5 million fighting this, this referendum for, for a tax, whereas the health ad advocates had 82000 And although the polls were very supportive of the tax at the outset, $3.5 million of marketing in two little towns actually makes a difference. And, um, and the, 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 um, the, the tax was voted out. So this is serious power that, uh, that we're up against. Um, I was at a meeting in, um, in, in Italy last year with a whole lot of low and middle income countries that came together 
And the story was repeated and repeated and repeated in those countries. And that's when we came out with this Bellagio declaration about how to um, counteract um, big foods undermining of healthy food policies. Um, so that's on that website. So let me just uh, now briefly go through um, what's coming up uh, in, the, in the policy brief just to put some explanatory um, words around it. So uh, this is what Tariana Turia will be, will be um, uh, announcing at the end of the day. Um, we have some recommendations for government. Uh, first of all is a 20% a excise tax on sugar sweetened beverages with the funding going towards health promotion. That is important. That is important to be able to sell a tax. Taxes are not popular. If you do not have that rider, the public response will be, public support will be much lower. Um, out of all the potential taxes and subsidies, um, there's been quite a lot of debate and it seems like this is the cleanest and the best and you'll hear more about that um, later and particularly for New Zealand situation. Strengthening the, um, uh, the, the, the advisory guidelines for healthy food and beverages that got withdrawn. Um, in our studies in schools, um, sugar sweetened beverages is low hanging fruit. That's a thing that's actually relatively easy to change within school programs. Other things like um, packaged snacks are actually much tougher much more resistant, but this happens quite quickly. And so I think it's really quite important it's highlighted within these, uh, within these guidelines. Effective social marketing campaigns like we've seen in New York City and we're seeing at the moment in WA. And sugar sweetened beverages is an excellent um, focus for social marketing campaigns. And uh, restrictions on junk food mar uh, marketing and that's across the board. Fano uh, community groups, workplaces, for those organisations to have their own food and beverage um, policies, tailored education and awareness program, and if they are taking sponsorship funding to ensure it's for sugar-free products. For schools, uh, boards of trustees have responsibility around implementing policy within the schools. Professional organisations can support it and a strengthened curriculum around sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, for health, healthcare professionals around uh, around asking and uh, assessing and advising. This is the kind of approach for short uh, interventions, short consultations. In the past, this has worked quite well for things like exercise, green, green prescription, for example, because that can fit into, a, uh, into the paradigm of a, of a consultation, a 10-minute consultation. When they tried to put nutrition in, take the green prescription idea and put nutrition in, uh, in Australia, it fell over on its face. This, the whole nutrition thing is actually far too complicated and, and big a deal to, de to deal with within a, a usual GP consultation. But sugar sweetened beverages may not be. And that may be able to fit into a brief consultation. So I think that's, that's important. Um, and only sugar free beverages on the, on the healthcare premises. For industry, beverage companies promoting sugar free beverages as their default choice. I think it's probably happening a little bit more, but uh, we'd like to see that speeded up. Um, supermarkets and retail placement and promotions favours sugar-free beverages. Fast food chains, sugar-free option is the default and predominant choice. <clears throat> and for ag advocacy groups and NGOs, um, we'd be seeking support for this policy brief and for those organisations to pick up and champion various aspects of it. <clears throat> so um, Gerhardt's going to take this through a consultation process. Um, I've got his email up there. But there's lots of other things happening in the space and what comes from this meeting and this policy brief needs to link up with other things. Um, there's other advocacy organisations. Uh, we put the, the draft um, sugar sweetened beverage policies up there yesterday from the Obesity Policy Coalition in Australia. Um, Jane's here. I think they've all run out. Where's Jane? Is she here? Yeah, Jane's, Jane Martin is here. So if you want, contact her. Um, she's there. Informus, which is monitoring um, government action and food environments, is, is underway in New Zealand. Um, other policy developments like the announcement of Healthy Families New Zealand, uh, we have to link in with these. So there's a bunch of other things happening. So I'm hoping that people here can um, pick up their piece within this, within this policy brief and be a champion um, for it as we try and get uh, fizzy drinks um, up on the agenda and, uh, and off, off the dinner plate, <laughs> if you like. Okay, thanks very much.